April is National Poetry Month, so today I'm going to be giving you three tips for how to read more of it. Hi, and welcome to the book bar where everything bookish is on the menu. I'm Ann Jeanette Barr, and today I'm actually going to be recording two videos for you. So they'll go up one day after the other about poetry. Um, so I needed a big cup because I have a lot of talking to do. Like I said, this first video is going to be all about how to enjoy poetry more, what you can do to read more of it, and then my second video, which I hope that you will subscribe so that you'll be notified of, is specifically for those of you who have children. How can you engage your children in the act of reading poetry? Our family loves to read poetry, so I hope you'll stay tuned for that one as well. My drink, since I know we're always curious, is actually a... Um, a staple in my life. I drink this every single day. It's an herbal chicory and dandelion root blend. Um, if you follow me on Instagram or if you are not new to this channel, you know that books and warm drinks are my love language and I always have to have both around me, but I can't drink coffee all day long. So this kind of has that same bitter comforting flavor from, uh, that, that coffee does, but it doesn't have any caffeine. So since I'm recording a lot and it's that time of day, that's what I'm enjoying. I will leave a link to the specific brand that I drink in the comments as always. So let's just jump right in to the tips that I have for you for reading more poetry. Tip number one is to stop putting so much pressure on yourself. <laughs> Stop feeling like you have to be a certain sort of person or have a certain sort of academic background or even a certain level of intelligence to enjoy poetry. It's just not the case. Anyone can love poetry. Everyone should love poetry. And I think that a stumbling block for a lot of people is feeling like they have to read poetry a certain way or understand a certain type of poetry or enjoy a certain type of poetry. And so I'm here to tell you as, as an avid reader of poetry that you don't need anyone's permission to like poetry or to enjoy a specific kind of poetry. If you've clicked on this video because you think you don't like poetry, good job for giving it another try. I think a lot of people are dissuaded from enjoying or reading poetry because they had a bad experience with expectations, perhaps of teachers or of parental figures, um, for treating poetry a certain way. Uh, I personally enjoyed classes in school that dissected poetry and talked about the function and the form and the structure of different poets uh, that the different poets used. I liked analyzing iambic pentameter and I liked trying to model a certain poet's methods and create my own poetry. But I've got to tell you, I am not a good poet and I encounter a lot of poetry that I just don't enjoy and sometimes don't even understand. Um, I think that I am naturally drawn to poetry and that that helps, helps me overcome those um, potential roadblocks. But I have written lots of poetry. Um, I enjoy writing poetry. I think in particular when simple prose just wouldn't do. So when I'm feeling very reflective or um, when I have this line in my head that just sounds too pretty to be written in a paragraph. I'll write poetry. Um, I have submitted poems to various places and I've never gotten positive feedback or sometimes any feedback on my poetry. So you don't have to be a poet to like poetry. And in many ways, poetry is very subjective. Writing poetry for me when I do it is just a creative therapeutic exercise and I don't have any expectations at this point in life that I'm going to become a good poet. Although, like anything else, if I wanted to, I would put in those hours to study poetry and model great poets and see if I could improve my craft. But as a reader of poetry, you don't even have to know what is going into the poems you're reading. You can really just enjoy the experience. 
that is totally valid. And in fact, I think that's the only way to start because I think some for some people, when you start with the analysis, that's what burns you out from enjoying poetry. So if that's you and you're here, then that's excellent. And I am so excited to share some resources and ideas that I think are really going to help you out. So when you're thinking about just going into poetry, ready to enjoy or not enjoy whichever type of poetry you like, one way to take the pressure off is to get a hold of an anthology of poetry. Don't go in with the expectation that you must like a certain poet in order to be a fan of poetry or a reader of poetry. Get um, something that gives you a wide variety of poems. So, I've pulled some here from my shelves. When I was a kid, I did go through a very romantic phase of thinking that poetry and me were going to be super tight in my career, and I was going to, to master poetry. I think, <laughs> like many preteen girls, I thought that my ideas were new and beautiful and needed to be recorded, and not just the sort of fluctuations of <laughs> ideas that every preteen person boy or girl, goes through because we are coming into new ideas that we had been blind to before. But one of the things that got me through that time was absolutely my love of poetry. So these two books have been with me for a long, long time since that time because I remember thinking that I loved poetry, but I just didn't have enough exposure outside of those school lessons to feel like I could really call myself a lover of poetry. So I went and got these two short anthologies. They're Dover books. Dover creates very inexpensive um, printings of a lot of classics. And these two, the 100 Best Loved Poems and Great Love Poems, were are just edited collections of some of the classics. So just going through and, and reading these gave me an idea of my particular preferences in poetry. Here's another one that I own, which is Poems Every Catholic Should Know, and this was a gift that I am so grateful for. I'm, I really have enjoyed it. Um, it's um, compiled by Joseph Pierce, and if you're a Catholic, you might be familiar with him from a lot of the other things that he has edited and written. And it's the same sort of thing. It is a compilation of all of the great Catholic poems from throughout the ages and throughout the world. And in an anthology like this, there's no pressure to like every poem because they're all different styles, different lengths, um, written by different poets. And, you know, in this case, actually in, in all of these, you know, these are kind of determined to be the important contributions to poetry that you'll want to be familiar with. But again, there's no rules that you have to like them. It's more about becoming familiar. Um, another good one for English literature, <clears throat> for English language poetry, is the Oxford Anthology of Verse, I think it's called. Um, but really, any anthology you can find on the shelves for whatever price, grab that and start there, or get it from your library, and then Make note of which poets you actually enjoyed, which poems spoke to you, and just ignore the rest of them for now, and maybe you'll come to an appreciation of them later, and maybe you won't, and that's okay. But the purpose of this exercise is to find one or two poets that then you can become more familiar with. Um, in addition to anthologies, a good place to look for um, a variety of poets is in literary journals. So I have three here. This is the Ever Eden Literary Journal. This is a literary journal specifically by Catholic women. And then Dapple Things is also Catholic. Uh, the reason that I have so many Catholic things here is that I haven't been Catholic for very long, so I kind of took a deep dive into becoming more familiar with Catholic literature in the last few years. <clears throat> and then this one is Tidal Echoes, and it's local. So our local university every year puts together a literary journal full of poetry, prose, and photography from people here in Juneau and the surrounding area. And you don't have to have any special qualifications to submit to this journal. And so it's a really good sampling of just local talent. And sometimes it's, it's, really, it's a really fun start for people if they want to write 
but they don't have a lot of experience, they'll start by submitting to something like this. So this uh, is not going to have, actually, literary journals in general are probably not going to have classic poets or poets that have a lot of fame now um, because it's more emerging talent or local talent. Uh, but every once in a while, they'll like highlight a, um, a more experienced writer and include that in literary journals. So find a literary journal that appeals to you. Um, there are literary, literary journals for everyone. No matter what you like, <laughs> you'll find it. And they're usually, you know, they're periodicals, so you'll get them once a quarter or once a month. And that's a, a great way to expose yourself to a variety of different types of poetry. It's a good thing I got a big drink. I have asthma and one of these, <laughs> one of these candles is really smoky. Hang on. Okay, that one's gonna have to go away. Okay, tip number two. Be okay with liking certain poets more than others and just lean into that. Once you've found some poets that you really do enjoy, go ahead and read all the poems that they've written. Don't feel bad about sticking to one or two poets. It's just like when you like have a favorite fiction author and you read you know, their whole backlist, you really get to know their style, become very familiar with them. Maybe not their life story, but the essence of their creativity. And that's just a lovely relationship to have with a writer. So don't be afraid of that. I have some favorites. You'll see that a lot of my favorites are not contemporary, and that's just <laughs> kind of an old lady. I just like classic English literature. I like a lot of other writing as an experience, but what I always go back to is classic English literature. So some of my favorites, I've got this book of um, poems by Edgar Allan Poe, and the raven is in here, but if you aren't familiar with Poe and you imagine that he has written only dark and morbid things, it's worth reading his poetry. In fact, I had to look this quote up. He's famous for defining poetry as the rhythmical creation of beauty. Poe is definitely of the opinion that poetry should be beautiful first and foremost, that it should um, do something for your spirit, which sounds antithetical when you think of how kind of creepy a lot of his stuff is, but even the creepy stuff is famous for a reason because it really does just stir your soul, uh, and poetry is really good for that. So, um, so I like um, Poe's poetry. I don't love um, like, I remember the Telltale Heart just freaked me out, and so, and he did write one novel that I haven't, um, read, so I don't go in for dark super often, but his poetry is not dark overall, though there are some dark ones, so I have Edgar Allan Poe, and then I have some other favorites, Gerard Manley Hopkins, um, C.S. Lewis has, uh, lots of poems, if you aren't familiar. Um, and then, of course, Shakespeare, which I, I don't know, maybe goes without saying, and Robert Frost. Robert Frost is probably my favorite poem poet. Um, but a funny story about Shakespeare is I do think that Shakespeare started my love of poetry because I do remember reading his sonnets in school and thinking, this is genius. I had no idea that you could write with such intention, and that's what really hooked me. Hang on, my cat's meowing. I have to go let him in. Okay, Totoro, if you're going to meow, you get to be on camera. Hi. My dog is actually in here too, but he was being quiet. This is Totoro. He's been in a video before. We'll see if he'll stay in this one a little longer, but I doubt it with the dog uh, annoying him. Anyway, so I remember um, being fascinated by Shakespeare's sonnets. It was long before I had read any of his plays and um, studying those in school. And then I went to the used bookstore and I found this very old Shakespeare book you've got to see. Hi. <laughs> yep, and he's out. Um, this very, very old uh, Gems from Shakespeare has an inscription in it written in 1921. Oh my goodness, you guys, that's a hundred years ago. And it was um, 
published before that, obviously, in a time when there were no copyrights in the, in the books. And it's such a pretty little book. I just loved it. I think I got it for 50 cents because it was falling apart. And <laughs> this is a total aside, but one of the, the largest tragedies of my creative childhood is that I wanted to preserve this book and I just felt like it was um, something very valuable. So I took it to my school librarian thinking that she would know what to do and asked her if she could fix it and she used packaging tape on it. Ah! <laughs> so my archivist and, and um, public librarian friends are probably like, oh my goodness, but she had good intentions. So this is only valuable to me at this point, but I loved it. I loved how pretty it is. I loved the little snippets from his plays and also from his sonnets. And um, reading these beautiful words inspired uh, a lot of my creativity as a child. So when you find a poet that you enjoy, just enjoy them and just go ahead and read and read and reread um, that poetry and don't let anyone make you feel like you're doing it wrong. You may also find that it's not a particular poet that you enjoy, but a particular style of poetry. And the same rule applies. If you only like one type of poetry, just read that poetry and don't feel bad about it. Life is too short for that. Someday you may branch out and like other types of poetry, but if not, that's okay. So uh, some examples of different types of poetry. Um, I have this, I, I love Jewel unashamedly, but um, to illustrate the fact that if you like music for the lyrics, if you really love evocative song lyrics, you probably already love poetry and just don't know it. Jewel is among many singer-songwriters who consider themselves poets first, I think, um, and then, you know, the music flows with or after uh, their, their poetry. So this is her autobiography, um, but she does have a book of poems. So uh, you may find that some of your favorite musicians are also poets, so you may want to start there. Or you may just love reading song lyrics, and that's poetry, you guys. It's totally poetry. Uh, other examples are haikus and spoken word. So um, this is such a fun little book. This is uh, a poem for each um, element on the periodic table. And I bought this for my kids because we study the periodic table of elements, but I loved that it also fits some poetry in, like bromine. It says, the shame of your name, now lost except to the Greeks, no need to still fume. And then at the bottom, it has a little um, blurb about bromine or about each element. Bromine's name derives from the Greek bromos, meaning stench, and a little bit more. So this is just a fun example of haiku, but haikus are a specific style of very short poetry with rules about how many syllables can be on each line. And so that's a fun thing to explore. It doesn't take much time to read a haiku or to write a haiku, and it doesn't have to rhyme. So there's not as the same kind of pressure for a long form poetry, um, but it's still an art for sure. And this is Amanda Gorman's speech, um, her spoken word poem that she gave at this year's inauguration. And um, I picked this up at Costco, so uh, you may find a copy there. And it's just a hardbound version of this um, poem, you know, a few lines at a time. But if you haven't watched her delivery of this poem, start there. You don't have to buy the book. I bought the book because I hope that my children uh, this next year for poetry that we can rewatch her delivery of it while reading this little book and then practice our recitation by uh, trying to read it or even to reinterpret the way it's read. Um, spoken word is a, a style of poetry that sometimes rhymes, but it's more about the rhythm of the words and really that, like I said, the delivery of the words. And so you may be drawn to that musical rhythmic quality of spoken word and just stop there and only read spoken word poetry or listen to spoken word poetry and that's totally okay. It's great to explore different styles and find what really calls to you. And my third tip is to make a ritual of reading poetry. 
that's a segue into the video that I'm posting tomorrow, which is all about poetry tea time, because that's how my family and I get poetry in, and I just love it as a family practice, but you don't have to do it with anyone else to enjoy it. Light a candle, make yourself a cup of tea, and end your day with a handful of poems. In fact, that's what I did with this book. I read um, poems every Catholic should know, uh, during adoration, which is a time when you are in the, the chapel um, all by yourself or with few people, just in the presence of the Eucharistic host and just meditating and praying um, by yourself. And so during that time, I brought poems every Catholic should know and used them to guide my reflection during the hour that I was um, there at church. You could also consider beginning your day with poetry if you don't have another morning ritual. But briefly, just in case you don't watch my next video or you don't have children, I uh, just brought out a few of the books that we read during our poetry tea time to give you further examples of uh, types of poems or poets that you might want to explore. Poetry can be humorous, it can be downright silly, and it's just delightful to read a poet like Shel Silverstein, and it doesn't matter how old you are, these things will crack you up, and it's totally valid to still read Shel Silverstein or any other humorous poet as a grown-up. Um, my favorite of his is Boa Constrictor, <laughs> and I, I can't even... <laughs> I can't even say the name of the poem without cracking up because I've read it to my kids so many times and it evokes such funny images in my head of their delight and their laughter that it just makes me happy. So don't short yourself by not reading things like this as a grown-up. Um, we also really enjoy Paul Fleischmann. Uh, he has these call and response, how it's an, what's another way to, um, to describe them? duet um, sort of poems. That he, There's a couple of these. This one is called Joyful Noise, Poems for Two Voices, and this particular one is about insects. So, um, for instance here, I'll just pull one up. Uh, fireflies. So there's two columns, and the first person reads uh, the, the first column, second person, second. Sometimes they're saying the same thing at once, like this first line is light, and then the second person says, is the ink we use, and they both say, night, and the first person says, is our parchment, and the second person says, we're fireflies. Both say, well, one says fireflies, while the other says flickering, flitting, flashing, fireflies, glimmering fireflies, and that delivery of that duet back and forth and sometimes together such a cool experience and it doesn't matter if you're um, just reading it and imagining someone saying that aloud or reading it with another person. Um, it's just a unique uh, poetry experience and I highly recommend this this poet and this particular book for especially if you are or have in your life insect lovers. These are so good, so delightful. And then um, this entire series of books, Poetry for Young People, uh, you can find them used all over the place. Um, it's actually by Scholastic. Uh, has selections of poems that are, are more or less appropriate for children from famous poets. So this is actually a good place to start for anyone. Um, for, you know, like this one is Emily Dickinson, but you can find them for all kinds of um, just so many different poets and then even on themes like I have one for seasons I have one with American poets and they're thin but they're also really um, nicely illustrated so I like these to use with my kids and what we do in our family is to um, light a candle and get a cup of tea and sit down and read a handful three to five um, poems from a book like this, or sometimes we study a particular poet. And we do this at least once a week. Um, some seasons we do it a lot. And it's such an, a grounding uh, experience that we even, for a season before COVID, uh, created a community group where we all gathered together at the tea shop and we did the same thing and we had our kids read up in front of the group their favorite poems and the adults too. And I was so shocked at how comfortable they all got so quickly. Even my children who are not as 
social or um, outgoing and I thought that they might be worried about their, their reading or just be worried about being up in front of people. When it came to sharing their favorite poems, they had no problem. It was a really great experience and we see that in our house too. Uh, just with our, you know, immediate family is that when we all get together to read poetry, if you've done it more than once, even the second time around when it becomes more routine, uh, it's so comforting, the ritual of sharing poetry with each other. It really just takes getting started. So my whole next video is going to be all about how we do that. So definitely watch that one if that appeals to you. Um, but in any case, one way to become more comfortable and familiar with poetry this month during National Poetry Month is to just set aside a specific time and read some poetry. I hope you found that encouraging and also I hope that you share with me your favorite poets because I'm ready to take on some more. And if I didn't cover the reason that poetry intimidates you or that you don't enjoy poetry, leave that in the comments below and let's have a conversation. Thanks so much for watching the book bar and as always, also tell me what's in your cup.